Hello, and thank you for joining our LinkedIn Live series, where we are continuing to explore how data and analytics are influencing a wide range of industries. My name is Jeremy Petranka, and I am the Associate Dean of the Quantitative Management Programs at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Our Master of Quantitative Management programs are designed to bridge the gap between more modern data science tools and the specific strategic and operational needs of businesses. Today, I'm extremely excited to be able to get into some of the more cutting edge data science tools that we're seeing specifically in the genetics world and how it's transforming industry and allowing biological innovation to occur at a speed that's really just been unheard of until now. As luck would have it, we happen to have a Fuqua alum that sits squarely in this world and has agreed to let me geek out for the next 30 minutes as we talk about this. So in particular, Dr. Carrie Ann Smith is an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics at UNC Chapel Hill, where she works to understand these interesting segments of DNA that exist across species. So humans, fish, and plants kind of sharing these, these common threads. So possibly even cooler, Carrie founded the Society for Scientific Advancement, which is an international nonprofit she ran for almost 10 years that focuses on making improvements in STEM infrastructure for underserved groups in developing countries as a means for social advancement. So prior to her earning her Master of Science of Quantitative Management from Fuqua, she earned a PhD in biochem and molecular biology from the University of Georgia and completed a bachelor's and research master's in biochem from the University of West Indies. So Carrie, I'm feeling a little bit underqualified at this point. However, thank you for being here today. So with that, um, I want to start by, for those that are watching that don't have necessarily a, a strong understanding of what's happened in the world of genetics, in the last 10 to 15 years, I want to start painting the picture of where we were before that and pull back the curtain. So if you don't mind, could you give kind of a high level view of what this type of research and, and you know, the types of innovations that were occurring before around 2010? So if you think in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s, what did it look like there? First of all, thanks so much, Jeremy. I'm happy to be here. And thanks for that super kind introduction. And, you know, that really is a fantastic foundational question. And you're right, you know, it kind of takes us back to more than 10 years ago, maybe 15 or 20. And I think what really changed was the development of technologies, what we call deep sequencing technologies, that allowed us to understand the composition of the genome or the entire DNA sequence of a human or animal or plant, any organism really. And at a basic level, the components of DNA sequence, this DNA sequence, which by the way, for a human would stretch from here to the moon something like 100,000 times if you unwound it all and connected it end to end. But basically only four components or nucleotides abbreviated as A, G, T, C, four letters is what it's comprised of. It's just that we're dealing with billions of these nucleotide letters plus different arrangements of these letters plus different types of interactions with a plethora of other cell components. <clears throat> so these complex combinations are what drives the vast complexity of a human being. And yet we now have the capabilities and data to study this complexity at a granular level. So to, to go back to your, to, to your point or your question, prior to this, the development of the genomics field, as we call it, we as genetic scientists took more of a single gene investigative approach or investigated based on more specific individual hypotheses. So that's really kind of what changed in the past decade or decades. So, so in the using the moon, uh, <laughs> the moon example, so to, to dumb it down for me, so was it the case that before, if you were thinking about all these, you know, the A, G, T, and Cs just spread out over, oh, back to the moon, uh, to the moon and back over and over and over. Was it before you were basically taking like a mile chunk of that and exactly. just at that at each time? Mm -hmm, exactly. Or even short, you know, even, yeah, let's, let's use a mile, for example. So you could sequence short segments and you were able to use that information to, to study what that particular segment, and let's call, let's say a mile is equal to a gene. So you'd be able to study that particular gene, deplete it or manipulate it somehow, um, then, but right now you can not only sequence many genes or identify many genes, you can then use the output of these genomics type of analysis to monitor outcomes based on like the changes that happen in cells and whatnot. So yeah. before, when you were just looking, you know, it, it feels like before, if you're looking at it for a mile out of that long, it's basically needed on a haystack. Mm -hmm. Were you basically, did you have to know where to look or were you basically just guessing? Right. There were approaches such as cloning where you'd be able to kind of isolate the target 
that particular target or you'd have some information to go up to go off so maybe conservation you you know of the gene in, in a human cell type you could go and look for a similar gene based on conservation of precise sequence regions and that would inform your experiments that would enable you to to kind of deductive reasoning to to inform on the next step Okay, so it fell before like a, a, an educated needle in a haystack yes. that you really kind of had to know where to look. Um, and so that feels like then it's changed from 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 kind of what you implied in the last 10 to 15 years. So mm -hmm. what what did change? So the 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 technologies to give us the information at you know, uh, at the level of billions of nucleotides, and then um, tools such as CRISPR, for example, that um, allow us to to query and not not only qu query the function, but also allows us to manipulate um, precise sequences in the DNA. And let's to, you know to go into more a little bit more about just CRISPR. You know, it's it. Well, this is such an amazing technology, and what's quite remarkable for me, at least, is how simple simple it is and how well it works. And this is the best part. Um, and what it does is allows us to make very very precise cuts in DNA, for example, between an AG and a TC. And what this can do is then turn genes off or on and sh or change them, for example. And this works to varying levels of success in human cell types, various animal cell types, plant cell types, and I could go on. So what changes is is capacity. To, to read out the sequence of the genome, as well as the development of many tools to manipulate it. Um, and you know we're kind of developing these things at rapid pace. So it, it feels like, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, there's kind of two, two technologies that, that have changed the game. One is to be able to not just get a mile of that sequence to the moon and back, but to effectively get the entire the entire map of what that looks like mm -hmm. to the ability now to precisely say, well, now that we know everything, if we just want to change that three feet right there, we can with CRISPR. Exactly. And, um, and, and that's powerful and has, um, so many implications and uses already. And, you know, Jeremy, and that's kind of even looking at it in a very simplified way, because those are two technologies, two enabling technologies, but there are so many others because we have access to the data and, and, and now we can kind of tweak so many approaches um, that kind of have, have, have developed concomitantly as well. And by the way, those that have never heard the term uh, uh, CRISPR before, it stands oh. for off the top of my head, clustered regularly interspace short palindromic repeats. <laughs> yes. And you know, you know what, where CRISPR comes from, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it, it comes from a bacterial kind of immune system. So it, it stems from how bacteria uh, fend off viruses, which in itself is kind of really cool. And then they maintain that memory. And that's how they use if the same kind of virus attacks the bacteria later on, they can quickly respond because they've, they've been exposed before. So that's, that's kind of where the technology itself, com itself comes from. And then we've adapted that to manipulate it in just so many cell types. So it feels like even, the, the, first off, uh, that technology is so incredibly cool, but even if CRISPR had been um, you know, conceived 30 years ago, without having the insights you have to what the full sequence is, it wouldn't be nearly as as useful. Is that is that fair? Yeah, exactly. You're you're on point uh, because the and you know it the CRISPR itself and 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 um, its origins have been studied for a while, and you you know technically could have been adapted, but it would have been going back to that mile analogy, like on a much smaller scale. So now, for example, we can edit or. Um, turn off or on many genes in a, in a particular gene family by targeting the CRISPR, the CRISPR or CAS actually, to the correct place. Mm -hmm. so, so on point, yeah. And kind of pushing more into that data side that, that you know, the, the CRISPR on its own can do one thing, but CRISPR with the data opens up the world. Can you talk more about, um, you know, to me, it, it almost feels like the, the kind of convergence of these technologies in the genetics world is, is very similar to the convergence of these technologies in the data science world. Some mm -hmm. of the algorithms have been studied for decades, but it wasn't until you had this horsepower of cloud computing and everything else that you really saw it everywhere. And now those two together 
it feels like is, is allowing some of the, the innovations you're seeing. Could you talk about how the data is used, you know, in terms of potentially what data science is used, but in general, how you're using it? So I, to, to give you an idea, that, uh, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you're well aware of all of these, I did a quick search and found over 50 genome editing uh, coding software tools. Most of them are open source. And I have no idea what they did, but the fact that this is available now feels like there's so much going on that I'm unaware of. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite it, it's quite amazing. I guess let's think of it this way: we as humans are made up of many different cell types with very different functions. Um, a beating cell in the heart does not do the same thing as a neuron in the brain. Yet all of our cells have the same genome or DNA sequence. So like, including mutations that arise for different reasons, but that's another story. Um, so how can we kind of effectively use tech such as CRISPR to know where to cut and given the vastness of the genome and the billions of letters, and this is like a data problem, right? The sheer numbers of AGTCs, the computations, the interactions, the permutations of all these things. And fortunately, and in part because of the way that science is funded, there are a plethora of tools. And as you mentioned, many are publicly available and quite straightforward to use. So basically, anyone with the appropriate training can kind of learn how to edit these genes. And, you know, to, to like high powered computing and just the access of tools, you know, we're, we're there where because of the, 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 the way that these, these tools and know-how has facilitated just, just vast uh, um, amounts of sequencing data, data science and bioinformatics and computational know-how in general are just critical to answer the kind of big research questions where we are today. Um, because not only do you have to kind of manipulate or understand the sequence composition, um, you have to be able to look at multifactorial responses across a sample of individuals, for example. <clears throat> so the, the kind of computational tools and high powered computing is, is critical. Um, and it moved us away from where we started with that we discussed a, a, a few minutes ago with a single gene kind of approaches. Um, and now that the costs are much lower and the sequencing and the, and the computing power is much lower, it's just become more accessible, which means that many, many people can now do these types of approaches. So, um, that was probably a roundabout way to, um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> to, to, to get at your question. But, it, it was perfect. So if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you have all these AGTCs just, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say randomly, uh, but it's not random, but it looks random from the outside, just over and over and over. And you're mm -hmm. actually using the, the, the data science, the analytics, the bioinformatics tools to start finding patterns, but not just patterns, patterns within patterns, because- Exactly. It, <laughs> okay. right. Yeah, and I, I guess I can use um, an example of, of, of my research to, to illustrate um, to illustrate this point. Uh, so on, on, so just to give you some background on, on what I work on to contextualize, um, uh, we know that, we now know, but you know, and we touched on this before, <coughs> excuse me, that um, the genome sequence, so the, you know, the order of letters, and it kind of looks random to, to, to an outside eye. And, but what was thought was that Mo as humans, we'd be much more complex than, say, a house mouse, for example. That's not how it actually turned out. We, we have the similar number of genes relative to a mouse, but only 3% or so codes for proteins, which was a surprise. And I studied the rest of it. You know, so, so the proteins are kind of easier to study because there are some consistencies across species that, that make it easy to deduce their functions for a new protein, for example. The rest of the genome, the 97%, is mysterious, or, or, and that's the area I focus on. So, um, for example, I use computational approaches um, such as machine learning to use sequence patterns in one species, as well as how proteins interact with certain um, segments of DNA, and then use that to kind of predict function in 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 this ninety seven percent of kind of enigmatic um, enigmatic sequence. When you say function, you mean the cells function, right? Right. Well, not the cells function. the The role that the that particular molecule plays within the cell. Got so, it. for example, it could somehow um, help to to 
make sure that a beating heart cell continues to beat. It might help to optimize that process, for example. And without it, you would have some beating, but you wouldn't have as optimal beating of the, that particular cardiomyocyte, for example. So, it, sorry, it, 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 uh, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by all this. And it feels to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were given a very, very long book in a language no one has ever told you about. Mm -hmm. you recognize that you know the English language has 26 characters, this has four characters, mm -hmm. and your world is basically now trying to figure out what words mean, but words can mean different things inside of different sentences. Yes. And trying to back out what that book means, and CRISPR allows you to actually change words and change meaning. Right, in it. yes. So that's, that's cool. And that's a great, you know, so, you 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 use the computational tools. It looks like all gibberish, but there are patterns <laughs> in there. So you use the computational tools to identify the patterns, and then for you know, so say for example, um, each chapter is in a different language, and that specifies oh. a different issue. So then you use the patterns in chapter one to kind of infer some meaning to help you to build to understand the second language in chapter two. That's amazing, and that that explains when when, when I saw on, on your profile that, that you've been using some natural language processing for this. That makes sense now, where the overlap is. Right, you know, and actually, right now we're using a BERT derived um, transformer tool to predict how RNAs and proteins, so two molecules within the cell, interact with each other, and then how that is conserved across species. So shout out to. Fuqua faculty for, <laughs> you know, I, I knew what Bert was, could, you know, was able to um, tap into that when, when, and build up on that. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it just really opens up um, huge capabilities and how transferable these skills are is, is just like amazing. So we have the Bert Foundation. Oh, my apologies. Let, let's start actually talking about where they've been transferred and where we're seeing that, um, if you're open to it, I'd love to now talk about actually moving into industry and actually bringing this, um, you know, bringing this into in industries and innovation. Three in particular that we traditionally hear are just poised to be transformed. And, and if we have time, I'll ask you later about how much of that is hype, how much is real, where are we in that curve? But if you're open to it, I'd love to talk about agricultural healthcare and energy, starting with agriculture, because you have a master's in plant diseases, so you seem like the perfect person to talk about. Can you talk a little bit about how we're seeing these new tools and this new ability to not just find the words, but change the words, um, how it's transforming agriculture, uh, potentially at a global level? Yeah, sure. You know, so um, I kind of gave background in the human context or mammalian cell context, but much of what I touched on is also true for plants, as well as um, organisms con commonly considered to be agricultural pests. Uh, so, for example, just to touch on a few applications, CRISPR can be used, and you know, can just stick with with, with CRISPR, like as a as a um, example of a gene editing tool, because it's like I won't say the best, but it's very effective and efficient. So, CRISPR can be used to manipulate plant genes in the same way, so that and and some possible outcomes that people, um, companies, or or researchers would target are more robust. Um, or sturdy plants uh, that are, are are resistant to adverse conditions or plant diseases, for example. Um, and but not only that, you, when you think about these these pest organisms, using insects as an example, you you can edit genes in the, within them to that affect their ability to transmit diseases to plants or reproduce less less efficiently. As quick examples. And in terms of just where we are and how realistic um, this, the, these, this kind of work is, I'd say the limitations here are really based on how much data we have. Do we have the sequences? So for example, we have the entire genome sequence of a human and um, um, most of a mouse or nearly all, you know, fairly complete. But some of the limitations in agricultural context, we've been studying humans and, and animal models, for example, for a while. So the, the limitations here that, that affect the reality of what we're able to do is whether we have the entire genome of the plant or insect of interest, for example. Some of these genomes, especially plants, are even larger than human genomes and it can be more difficult to get accurate data. But once we have that, to build upon, we can do the same things as I mentioned before, based on the, the species of the plant and how easy it is to introduce some of the components of, of CRISPR. Um, 
because there are differences in, in, in efficiency and experimental ease, for example. And where are we seeing a lot of that innovation happening? Is it at the, the kind of traditional large agricultural companies that, that you know, might be household names? Mm -hmm. or are we seeing uh, kind of a, a startup community start start, especially yeah. living in a world where once the data is out there, once the genome is sequenced, sounds like anyone with a, access to cloud computing can start doing some work. That's what makes it awesome. It's so accessible and it really is driving just so much innovation. I'd say both in terms of, you know, you'd expect um, large companies who have been invested in agricultural everything for a while to, to, be, to, to, to be pushing in these directions. Um, and this is just such an active space, but also startups and smaller entities, you know, both groups are kind of coming together to push innovation. And I, in general, I think it's it's quite broad ranging what their targets are and still different enough where there's room in the space. And because this, this could be whether developing or improving upon crops that do better under like various climate conditions and, you know, climate change concerns these days or require less resources than are typically needed. Um, so they can be kind of, um, grown more more easily and then there are there are kind of i guess maybe on top of that next level is uh tweaks gene tweaks to to, to make a more desirable product that has a better nutritional profile for example or cooking characteristics that kind of thing so i think you know the, the, across the spectrum various entities are pushing innovation and and it's a very exciting time to be in the space so if, if you don't mind, actually, and I think agriculture is the, the, the perfect lens to look at this, um, I, I want to kind of dive a little bit more into what it would take for innovation. So it feels like uh, there's going to be some upfront cost broadly, broadly defined in terms of mapping the genome of a particular plant you're looking at. Um, then it feels like it becomes less costly to do some of the analysis um, in, in terms of finding particular genomes um, with, with the technology that's out there. But then once you actually, let's say you realize, aha, we figured out a way to make this you know, wheat more resistant to insert bug here. I don't admittedly know, <laughs> um, but insert bug here. Um, and now we actually want to bring it to market. H how much is required, you know, even if you know how to, to modify and edit the, the genome, how much is required there? Is that still really capital intensive? Yeah, so, you know, I guess you, you <clears throat> Uh, maybe the limitation there is kind of getting approval um, and then getting, you know, scale. Because to, to kind of go back to each point, you're, you're, you're correct in that um, sequencing itself can be expensive, although uh, no, you can, based on different companies, depending on how large of the genome, sequencing costs have come down dramatically. So that's less of a hurdle. CRISPR, actually doing that part is is very inexpensive and quite straightforward to do. Sorry, how many um, digits are you talking on the actual um, on the actual sequencing? Like so sequencing, you know, there there are companies that will say in the hundreds of dollars you can get a genome sequenced. Oh, hundreds of dollars, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds of no dollars. hundreds of dollars. Um, I have not <laughs> compared <laughs> pricing, you know. So say on in an academic context where we kind of go through. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd expect, and I, I, I work more on on the the, ex, the 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 products of the genome versus the genome itself, um, and those experiments are in the thousands of dollars. So, so very far away from the hundreds of thousands. So, let's say hundreds to thousands. And you know, I, I haven't looked into the companies that say hundred hundreds to see exactly what, but that's in the let's let's say thousands. And then CRISPR, a CRISPR experiment can be, you know, to, to kind of get to the point where you know that it, it works can be in the hundreds. Um, so it really the cost there is less of a limitation as much as then when you know to to, to show efficacy and that you're reaching your target to, to get approval from the appropriate regulatory bodies and then getting to scale and marketing. That that part is much more um, costly than the, the, the initial part, just based on how far the technology has come. That, that feels like though an incredible field for innovation. Uh, you know, the, the numbers you're, you're talking, anyone with, you know, this, this isn't easy knowledge, but to develop the knowledge on how to start looking and, and what they're looking for, it really feels like you can have a lot of minds 
looking at this and get outcomes fairly quickly, which, which is incredible. One thing that I, I think that leads to that a lot of people, when, when they hear about you know modifying genomes that comes up, is the thought of ethics. And you had mentioned some regulatory boards. Um, obviously, touching on any of the particular applications, there's so much nuance and, and it, that that is impossible. But at a high level, could you kind of give us an idea of what decision-making bodies exist within this realm and who has a seat at the table? Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're on the money about the nuances, and it really is a lot to think through. Um, and especially as fields, so not only the gene editing, but especially as fields that are complementary um, are evolving also and improving rapidly. So we hear about designer babies and CRISPR has been used to change genes in human embryos that resulted in live births, as we've heard in the media. And then there are things that are happening, such as scientists are generating like sterile mosquitoes to, to combat diseases, etc. Who knows what the long-term environmental impact is and biological effects on the species and adjacent species. So policy frameworks exist and there is guidance from regulatory bodies such as the FDA, for example, as it pertains to healthcare. Uh, but I wonder, um, and I guess this is my personal opinion, is that regulatory bodies are kind of possibly lagging behind and this is simply due to just the pace at which the science is evolving. We're really progressing at lightning speed and not only with gene editing, but with reproductive science, cloning, gene therapy, et cetera. So, you know, there, while there are laws that exist, I don't know that it covers the breadth of organisms that we're able to edit using CRISPR. Um, so like in addition to the FDA and probably agricultural regulatory bodies, um, I don't know that the, the kind of swath that we need of covering e ecological impacts and natural resource management, as well as, healthcare issues are covered um, by, by, you know, I think this needs to be worked on as much as, and I'm not aware that it's, in, it's, it's there as much as fast as the science is, um, is going. And this is just my kind of personal view. So we really need scientists, policymakers, and varying skill sets at the table um, working to keep ahead of this. And, and kind of, I don't know if that, you know, I, I can't really say who is at the table um, currently, but that's kind of my personal view on where we are and where consider some considerations. And, and I have a feeling that uh, other viewers out there are probably like, probably like me that would love to talk about that particular thing for hours on end. But because we're, we're close to out of time, um, yep. you mentioned designer babies. And I know that that is one of the fears when you're talking about uh, working on the human genome. But more broadly, can you talk about where we're really seeing some of the innovation in healthcare as it possibly comes to personalized medicine or other, you know, other applications? Yeah. Um, oh, Jeremy, there's so much to say here. Yeah, there's just so much. Um, and, you know, in, an, in a nutshell, and, you know, this is the basis of dozens, if not more startups, as well as big pharma, biotech, established biotech, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this ranges from detecting infections. There are CRISPR approaches for COVID detection, for example, cancer treatment, therapies for heart disease, overcoming hurdles in organ transplants and drug delivery. And this is just a touch on a few uses. Um, some of the most advanced cases actually involve the treatment of genetic diseases that arise to deleterious changes in in, in genes or so mutations in blood disorders. And I think that this has been quite promising and is very close in the clinic and is very close. I think that's, you know, we just touched on the FDA, for example, and I think that is approaching either application for um, approval or we're getting there. And that would be, that would be huge. And I think companies are lined up behind this first example, if it were to be approved. And, you know, this, this is, curing or close to curing these diseases that have been a problem for a while. So there's just so much there and it's a very ex exciting time to be in that space. So that is that is incredible. And, and I'm going to unfairly now ask you with that and other things and then, you know, in, in about a minute, 10 years from now, where are we going to be? Uh, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think we'll, def we'll, um, we'll develop more precise and defined, refined capabilities um, because other tech advances are coming, um, are coming on stream and are, in, are, are being improved. For example, spatial analysis. Again, shout out to Fuqua and uh, faculty <laughs> for you know, introduction to machine learning regarding image analysis because this is where we're going. So I think what we'll be able to do is combine a lot of what we've spoken about today um, 
that will enable us to make very precise changes, which we can do, but how we want to make them and where we want to make them, and then monitor the outcome spatially, like at a granular level within specific cell types within the brain. And then you can image it and then monitor the changes in various contexts, in normal development, um, in animal models, for example, in disease context, et cetera. So I think we'll, we'll just be able to um, tap into those um, in a, to tap into in, into advancement in a in a more um, specific and granular level in, in the next ten years. So I hate to do this, Dr. Smith, but we are unfortunately out of time. I cannot thank you enough for being a part of that. I can't think of anyone else that is, that is so well positioned to talk about this. And it, it's obvious I could your your enthusiasm for this just comes through, and I could talk for hours and days about this. Um, so thank you. And thank you so much, Jeremy. This was this was absolutely fun. So for I everyone watching both hats. Oh my apologies. Oh no. For I get to wear both hats, you know, to the <laughs> post science and true. contextualize it. That was great. Thank you. So for those of us, uh, anyone watching, please join us for our next conversation on March 7th with David Harvey, a social science research analyst at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He's going to talk about how data is used to improve healthcare outcomes for patients, not at the genetic level, but actually at the clinician level. So please follow Fuqua on LinkedIn to stay in the loop about these analytics conversations and also our series featuring faculty members and insights from their research.